Welcome again to Nefertib Online Nefrology Lectures. This is uh, the third uh, lecture regarding electrolytes and acid-based disturbance. In the previous two lectures, we discussed the hyponatremia and hypernatremia, and this lecture will discuss in details uh, hypokalemia practical approach. All the videos of Nefrotube webinars are available uh, on our YouTube channel, Nefrotube. The PowerPoint is available at the website nefotube.com. Please join our group and like our Facebook group, our Facebook page, uh, as our Nefotube team posts daily, posts daily uh, MCQs, cases, and uh, many materials related to nephrology. And you are welcome to follow us on Twitter. In general, hypokalemia diagnosed when the plasma potassium concentration is less than 3.5 milligram per liter. This is my talk outline presentation, and then uh, a short note about normal potassium homeostasis, uh, then the practical diagnostic approach for hypokalemia, and finally the management. Starting by presentation, there is no specific presentations, no specific presentation for hypokalemia. The clinical signs and symptoms are general, non-specific. And usually all are related to the disturbance in the excitability of different tissues as potassium is important for the normal excitability of all excitable tissues in our body. So any disturbance of potassium, whatever in cases of hypokalemia or even hyperkalemia, there will be a disturbance in the excitability of the tissues with normal with abnormal response. So patient with hypokalemia may be presented by fatigue, constipation, proximal muscle weakness, hypotonia, and even cardiac arrhythmias. In chronic cases, they may be hypertension because there is an evidence that hypokalemia induced hypertension and the opposite is true. This may be related to the normal physiological response that in case of hypokalemia, there is more absorption of sodium, reabsorption of sodium in the nephron. And also there may be glucose intolerance and finally decrease urinary concentrating ability due to disturbance of the hyperosmotic medullary interstitial. This is how the ECG of hypokalemic patient will appear. You may find prolongation of the PR interval, may be depressed ST segment, some way, some about flattening of the T wave, and finally, if the patient has a U wave, it may be prominent in these cases. Regarding the normal potassium homeostasis, regarding the normal potassium homeostasis, Two important points that we will discuss in this uh, issue. The first is that the normal potassium concentration gradient difference between the cells and the extracellular fluid is maintained by, by what is called the sodium potassium pump. By concentration gradient, normally potassium escapes from the cells to the extracellular fluid through leaky channels. Then the sodium potassium pump cause a re-entry of potassium back into the cells by using a primary active transport and the use of ATP. This activity is very important for the normal excitability of different tissues. And so any factor which will activate sodium potassium pump will cause more entry of potassium again into the cell causing hypokalemia and the opposite. Any factor which decreases the activity of the sodium potassium pump will decrease the re-entry of the potassium back into the cell, causing hyperkalemia. That's why in the different causes that we will mention later, we will find causes which affect the sodium potassium pump will affect potassium level. For example, beta-2 agonists and insulin will activate different pathways, which will finally activate sodium potassium pump, causing re-entry of potassium into the cell and causing hypokalemia. The second important regulator of potassium in our body is the nephron. In short, potassium is reabsorbed by, after it is filtered through the glomerular basement membrane. About 65 to 70% will reabsorb it in the proximal community tubule. About 25% will reabsorb it through the famous transporter, sodium potassium chloride transporter in the ascending loop of Henley. And maybe some may be reabsorbed in exchange with hydrogen 
in the distal part of the nephron by the potassium hydrogen antibody. The main site for potassium excretion and the main regulator for the potassium excretion is in the distal part through the effect of the aldosterone hormone. So finally, what I want to say that aldosterone hormone, if it acts on the distal tubule, it will increase potassium secretion causing hypokalemia if it is in high level, increase potassium, uh, sorry, increase hydrogen secretion, which will cause metabolic alkalosis, and increase sodium reabsorption and water reabsorption, and it may cause uh, hypertension. So the normal action of aldosterone is increased secretion of hydrogen and the potassium, while reabsorption is more for sodium and water. It's a very nice review article about regulation of potassium homeostasis. I uh, recommend it for you to read about potassium homeostasis in details. Okay, what is the importance of mentioning the normal potassium homeostasis? As I said, that will make uh, the causes of hypokalemia more clear. As any cause of the cause of hypokalemia will cause mainly the hypokalemia by affecting its normal homeostasis. Regarding the diagnostic approach, if you have a case of hypokalemia, you have first to exclude transcellular potassium shift, which is mainly related to drugs. Many drugs that we are prescribing as nephrologists may cause uh, redistribution of potassium, as I mentioned, mainly through the sodium potassium pump, will cause redistribution of potassium again into the cell, causing hypokalemia. So you have to check in depth the uh, drug history of the patient. For example, beta agonists, insulin, thiophylline, caffeine may cause redistribution of potassium. Also, alkalosis may cause hypokalemia. As in case of alkalosis, and it is mainly related also to, uh, or usually related to hypokalemia. And we will discuss now in the approach how to diagnose if the patient has metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia. But in general, alkalosis causing the hypokalemia because in case of alkalosis, the cell will uh, get rid of hydrogen into the plasma to correct the alkalosis in exchange with potassium, which will go back into the cell causing hypokalemia. A long list of drugs that is usually and commonly prescribed that may cause hypokalemia. So uh, revising the drug history of the patient is very important before going in depth through the approach. So if we excluded a transcellular shift of hypokalemia, causing hypokalemia, we have to ask ourselves, as we did in cases of hyponatremia, is there any life-threatening emergency? If yes, so treat. If no, and the case is cold, you have to measure urinary potassium over uh, urinary creatinine. Is the ratio more than 15 or not? If it is more than 15, so there is a lot of potassium which is lost in the urine, so the cause will be a renal problem. If no, the ratio is less than 15, so the loss of the potassium is not from the kidneys. You have to ask yourself a question. Is the hypokalemia occurs in a matter of hours, especially if there is acute paralysis of the muscles in absence of acid-base disorder? If yes, check the patient thyroid profile. If the patient has criteria and lab parameters of hyper thyroidism, so, so the patient will be diagnosed as thyrotoxic hypokalemic periodic paralysis. If no, the patient will be diagnosed as familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis. If there is no acute paralysis, so you have to check the acid base of the patient, the ABG of the patient, and according to the uh, acid base disturbance, you will uh, diagnose the cause. But actually, if you look at all the causes here, we'll find that all of them will really be clear from the start. The patient is, will have diarrhea, the patient had laxative abuse, the patient has a villous adenoma, he will be presented by hematochesia and GIT disturbance, use of power cleansing agent, 
whatever you will find all of these causes will be clear or even a very rare causes that will be diagnosed later by exclusion. So actually, as I always try to simplify the approaches in my lectures, I think the most important part in this first part of the approach is the diagnosis of thyrotoxic hypokalemic periodic paralysis and familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I think this approach is important to diagnose these, uh, these two categories. But the other causes will be actually clear from the start and will be uh, diagnosed as a cause of hypokalemia without ongoing through the urine potassium urine creatine ratio, except the rare causes that will be diagnosed later by exclusion. So let's go through the most important part regarding our speciality nephrology. What if there is renal loss? If there is, there is renal loss, you have to check the acid-based disturbance of the patient. If there is metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, or normal acid-base balance. If there is normal acid-base balance, so the hypokalemia may be due to post-obstructive diuresis, recovery phase of ETN. And again, before I am going through this list, you will find that all the causes will be clear from the start. You will not be in need to, made, uh, to make the approach. Actually, post-obstructive diuresis, the patient will be oligoric, there will be history obstruction, recovery phase of ATN, especially in oligoric ATN, which will become uh, uh, in the recovery more uh, polyuric, which is a polyuric phase of acute kidney injury. In these cases, we, we always find hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, and even hypomagnesemia. Magnesium, always we will, we have to always check magnesium level in cases of electrolyte disturbance as, uh, electrolyte disturbance as uh, magnesium is related uh, to the uh, disturbance of many electrolytes as you will find in the lecture of, uh, in the article that I uh, recommend for you to read. Also find here penicillin, cisplatin, ammonium glycoside, foscarnate, all are drugs, and you will find them in drug history, and a very rare case, lysozymuria, that there is a loss of uh, lysozyme enzyme in the urine, very rare case uh, that will be diagnosed by exclusion. So mainly the causes of normal acid base balance with hypokalemia and renal loss will be clear from the start. Least important point, patient with metabolic acidosis. You have to measure the ammonia in the urine. If it is low, you will have distal renal tubular acidosis of amphotericin B. If it is high, you will find proximal renal tubular acidosis or telling loose sniffing, but the patient has diabetic ketoacidosis, erythrocygmidestomy, or the patient take carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Again, all these causes will be clear from the start, except for the distal renal tubular acidosis and the proximal renal tubular acidosis that we have to differentiate between them. And we will talk about them in depth or in details in uh, the next lectures about the acid-based disturbance. Finally, what if the patient has metabolic alkalosis? If the patient has metabolic alkalosis, you have to check the urinary chloride. If it is low, less than, uh, less, uh, <coughs> than uh, uh, 10 millimoles per liter or more than 20 millimoles per liter. If it is less than 10 millimole per liter, so there is a volume loss from the patient. The cause are vomiting, is gastric suction, congenital chloride diarrhea. Again, all the cause may be evident and clear from the start. But the most important is if the patient has urinary chloride more than 20 millimole per liter, if the blood pressure is normal or even low in some cases, as in Porter syndrome, the patient may. Uh, has a Porter syndrome or Gettleman syndrome or on diuretics. And again, if the patient is on diuretics, it will be clear from the start. If the patient is hypertensive, we will go through another approach. So it is important here to differentiate between Porter syndrome and Gettleman syndrome. According to this approach, both patients will have normal blood pressure, but it may be uh, lower in Porter syndrome. Both will have chloride more than 20 millimoles per liter, 
both will have metabolic alkalosis, both will have renal loss of, uh, of potassium, and sure, both will have hypokalemia. So how to differentiate between Parter syndrome and the Gettleman syndrome? At first, where is the site of the defect or the disease of both? Barter syndrome is the same as you prescribed for your patient for somite. There is a defect or a lesion, genetic disorder in the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the ascending, thick ascending loop of Henry. Gettleman syndrome is the same as if you prescribed for your patient thiazides. This patient has a disease or a defect in the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal part of the loop of Henry. So in both cases, as there is here a block for sodium urea absorption and here too, there will be a loss of sodium in the urine in both cases and causing polyuria. This will lead to volume depletion in both patients and volume depletion in both patients will increase aldosterone secretion and this very important point that we will use later to differentiate Barter syndrome and Gettleson, Gettleman syndrome from Liddell's syndrome later. So in both cases, there will be increased aldosterone secretion. And as we mentioned at the start or at the beginning of our lecture, that aldosterone will block the reabsorption or increase, in other words, it will increase the secretion of potassium and the hydrogen through the nephron. So increased potassium loss will cause hypokalemia and increased hydrogen loss will cause metabolic alkalosis. Till now, clinically, or according to the pathogenesis, both Barter syndrome and Gittelman syndrome have the same scenario except for the site of the lesion. So how to differentiate between both of them? Barter syndrome, age of onset is usually at early childhood, but Gittelman syndrome occur at childhood or even later at early adolescence. In Barter syndrome, the potassium loss is more, sorry, the sodium loss is more, so the polyuria and polydipsia will be more evident in Porter syndrome than Gettleman syndrome, and the dehydration is more prominent in Porter syndrome. That will explain why I will mention later that the patients with Porter syndrome may be hypotensive. Regarding the, potassium, the calcium loss, the urinary calcium is normal or high in cases of Porter syndrome, while it is low in cases of Gettleman syndrome. It is normal on high in case of Barter syndrome shortly because in uh, uh, Barter syndrome, the amount of sodium in the tubules is high. And physiologically, as the sodium in the lumen is high, this will decrease the reabsorption of calcium causing normal or high calcium in the urine in cases of Barter syndrome. And this is one of the most important uh, lab issues, issues that differentiate between Barter syndrome and Gettleman syndrome is the level of the potassium in urine. And finally, serum magnesium is low in cases of more in Gettleman syndrome as the disturbance or the region in this uh, co-transporter and this part of the nephron will affect also the magnesium reabsorption in Gettleman syndrome, causing more hypomagnesemia in cases of Gettleman syndrome, but in Barter syndrome, the magnesium may be normal. And finally, what if the patient has high urinary chloride and hypertension? If the patient has high urinary chloride and hypertension, we have to measure the serum uh, ren and aldosterone. And according to their levels, we may diagnose the case. If the patient has high ren and high aldosterone, so the primary disorder is the in the hyper secretion of renin, which will lead to high aldosterone level. <clears throat> this usually occurs in case of secondary hyperaldosteronism in your cause, which you cause, which will uh, uh, increase the renin level at first. Malignant hypertension, renovascular hypertension, renin secreting tumors. All these cases causes inc cause increase renin level, which will lead to high aldosterone level. <clears throat> so. In this case, you have to make renal double art sound and imaging for the patient abdomen and pelvis to exclude tumors and malignancies that may cause increased re renin secretion. If the patient has high uh, has uh, low renin and high aldosterone, 
So the primary etiology here is in the high aldosterone that will be followed as a feedback, negative feedback, feedback by inhibition of the renin. So the patient will have lower renin. This occurs if there is a primary etiology, primary disease, primary pathology in the adrenal gland in the form of primary hyperaldosteronism adenoma or hyperplegia or adrenal carcinoma. And finally, in cases, uh, rare cases uh, called glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism. Uh, also, uh, this category of disease is called the familial hyperaldosteronism type 1. In this disease, the release of or the secretion of aldosterone uh, is under the control of ACTH rather than angiotensin, which is a very rare genetic uh, disorder, mutation, that will affect the release of aldosterone, causing a high aldosterone level and low renin. Finally, if the patient has low renin and low aldosterone, so we have to measure serum cortisol. If it is high, low, or normal, if it is high, we know, we all know that cortisol in high level has a high mineral corticoid effect. So if it is high, it will may cause hypokalemia is in cases of Cushing syndrome, increase ACTH level, or if the patient is taking steroids. If it is normal, uh, this may be due to Liddell syndrome. And some of the enzymes deficiency that I will talk in the next slide about are due to licorice intake, carbinoxylone, and also, if it is low, it is it will maybe due to some enzymes deficiency that I will talk about them now. Let's let's talk about each point of these causes in some details. What is Liddell's syndrome? As we mentioned before, that the Porter syndrome is due to a lesion in the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the thick ascending group of Henle, and Gettleman syndrome is due to lesion in the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal part of the tube. Regarding Liddell syndrome, what is the lesion? The lesion is the distal part due to overexpression of the epical sodium channels. The overexpression of epical sodium channels will cause massive reabsorption of sodium with massive loss of potassium. So in this case, you will find reabsorption of sodium, which will cause hypertension and edema, and loss of potassium, which will cause hypokalemia. And this, what differentiates Liddell syndrome from Gettleman and Barter syndrome, that the patient is hypertensive and maybe edemptous, while in Barter and Gettleman, the patient is hypotensive or normotensive. And in Liddell syndrome, as a reflex or as a feedback, the aldosterone will be low. But in Gettleman and uh, Barter syndrome, as we mentioned, that the aldosterone will be high and that we will cause metabolic alcohols and hypokalemia in these cases. So at the end, the difference between Barter, Gettleman and Liddell's that the blood pressure is high in Liddell's, normal in Barter syndrome and Gettleman syndrome and maybe low in Barter syndrome. The aldosterone as a reflex will be increased in Barter syndrome and Gettleman syndrome while it be low in Liddell syndrome. Okay, what about these enzymes and how they affect the Potassium level. The norm, this is the normal pathway for the cholesterol and how other hormones will be developed from cholesterol. If there is 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme deficiency, so the arm of the normal pathway will be broken here with deficiency in cortisol and estrogen level. And the arm will continue into aldosterone causing a high level of aldosterone and causing a hypokalemia. While in case of 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency, there will be no formation or later formation of cortisol and aldosterone, and all the arm from cholesterol will go into estrogens, androgens, and androstenedione. All of these, especially in high level, have a high mineral corticoid effect causing hypokalemia. Back to the algorithm, how licorice may cause hypokalemia. Normally, the cortisol has aldosterone-like effect, has a high mineral corticoid effect. But normally, cortisol is converted 
into cortisone by 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase enzyme, decreasing its mineral corticoid effect. Licorice and many other drugs and gums cause hypokalemia by inhibition of 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, which will affect the level of cortisol, making a high level of cortisol, which will stimulate the aldosterone receptors with its high mineral corticoid effect causing hypokalemia. So that was the diagnostic approach for hypokalemia. What about the management? <clears throat> it is important to know that treatment of the cause of hypokalemia may cause severe repound hyperkalemia. So periodic assessment and monitoring of the serum potassium level is important. One of the most important point, what is the preferred route for the management of hypokalemia? Actually, the preferred route, especially in cases of severe or symptomatic hypokalemia is the intravenous route. But we have to know that the intravenous route is very burning for the vessels and we will give potassium into saline. So if the patient is hypervolemic, this may increase the hypervolemia. We cannot give the potassium in case of hypokalemia in dextrose because dextrose will stimulate the insulin release inside the body. As, and as we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that insulin will cause more hypokalemia. Okay, so the preferred route is the IV route, but with some precautions. How to calculate the potassium deficiency in the patient? We can use this equation, subtract the current potassium of the patient from four, then multiply by 100. For example, if potassium is 3.2 milliequivalent per liter, then the patient is deficient of 80 milliequivalent of potassium. So you have to replace 80 milliequivalent of potassium. How to replace the potassium? It depends according to the severity of hypokalemia. If the serum potassium more than three, or if the serum potassium less than three, or if the patient is symptomatic, whatever the level of the potassium. If the patient has severe hypokalemia or symptomatic, the correction must be more aggressive using a central line to avoid the burning effect of the potassium. While if the patient's serum potassium is more, is more than three, we may use a peripheral line, but also, but again, the preferred is central, the preferred is central. But in serum potassium, more than three milli equivalent, the infusion rate will be less. As you see here, if the patient has a severe uh, hypokalemia, you can infuse it from 20 to 40 milli equivalent potassium per hour in one liter of saline. And here you will infuse it about 10 milli equivalent per liter. Uh, if the patient is hypervolemic, you can substitute the one liter by 100 milli of saline, but if the, uh, there is a possibility to dilute the potassium more, it would be better to avoid its burning effect. Many approaches are available in the different literatures about how to deliver the total uh, infusion rate of the potassium. The most accepted is to give the infusion for about three hours and then recheck the potassium level again. And if the patient is still hypokalemic, you have to replace for another three hours and then recheck the potassium level again and so on. This is important to avoid the rebound hyperkalemia as if you are treating the cause of hypokalemia, the potassium may be corrected rapidly than you expected. An important point that if the serum potassium is more than three milligrams per liter, you may replace, and it is better to replace the potassium orally than intravenous infusion, you have to give the patient 10, 20 to 20 milli equivalent uh, of potassium two to four times daily with the maximum single dose of 40 milli equivalent uh, because the potassium may cause uh, gastrointestinal disturbance and gastrointestinal side effects. And finally, again and again, the care of the danger of rapid onset hyperkalemia, you have all those to three check potassium level. Thank you for watching and see you in the next lecture of hyperkalemia. Thank you.